How is your ability to love and be loved? Attachment style is the foundation to our psychology, but we know so little about it. Hello, I'm Kirsten Hunter. We are on Signposts for Living. And I'm joined here by my dear friend, Kristen. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Kristen Coggan, yes, got your name right. Mm. I've been saying it wrong for many years. I will get over that. <laughs> <laughs> Things could be worse. They could be, they could be. Okay, now I just want to be very clear why I've got my gorgeous friend, Kristen, here. Now, I'm a clinical psychologist and I've been, did you know I've been a psychologist for 20 years? No, I did not. I know, I know. 20 years. How are you feeling? That you're old. No. <laughs> I'll go with that. Yeah, 20 years. And I've been in private practice for 17 years. So the reason why we're doing this series is we're talking about all, well, not all, but vast majority of the clinical areas that we cover that I have really figured out is going to be helpful for people if they can get access to. So I think I think I made a list of 153 areas that we want to cover. How are you feeling about that? That's great because I'm really enjoying this. So that's fabulous. Okay. That's great. Well, I'm enjoying your company. So I've got Kristen along here because I just really enjoy her. She's got a gorgeous heart and she's got a beautiful brain. You're and we too have kind. I, well, I'm I'm speaking the truth. And we have a lot of fun together. We do. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Um, Kristen has no idea what we're talking about. No. So you you mentioned that you don't mind that. No, that's no pressure then. I don't have to think hard. I just turn up. You just turn up. So you turn up, I bring the material, and we have a good chat. Yep. Oh, Suits well, me. That sounds very good. <laughs> all right. So have you ever heard of attachment style before? No. Not at all. Not the words, not the phrase? No, and even when you just said it, I was mm. trying to think, what is that? What is that? I know. Here's what's, the what's, pro- what, what's my attachment style? Thank you. Let's talk. Okay. <laughs> now, okay, now that would be equivalent to, go along to going along to the schooling system and saying, I don't know what the ABC and the 123s are. Okay, yeah. So in psychology, attachment theory, attachment style is absolutely a foundation. Right. But no one knows what it is. But yet they will now. They will now. But it is it is the it is the um, you know the, the 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 process I guess that shapes our interpersonal function, how we feel about ourselves, and how we feel about other people. And if you've got something going wrong with your relationships, it's probably because your attachment style. Okay. It's, it's massive. It's massive. I can't. I can't. I can't really put enough around this. Well, let's get into it. I want to know. (laughs) Do you have any clues? No. No. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Okay. So attachment style is basically, literally, it is your ability to love and be loved. Okay. Yeah. It is how do I feel about myself? How do I feel about my, how worthy I am of being loved? How do I feel about trusting in your love for me? How do I feel about feeling stable and secure in that love? Mm-hmm. And everyone is so incredibly different with that. And what's really scary, and we'll get into it, is half the population is pretty screwed up on this front. Half the population. Right. Yeah, statistically. Oh. Now, good news. Good news. It's not set in stone. So I personally have have been unhealthy with this and then healthy with this and then unhealthy with this. So we okay. kind of move around. Mm-hmm. You know, we share the share the. And is, this, is are we just talking about your relationship with your partner or is it relationships on a whole? Well, it is primarily with your partner, but it's also with key friendships okay. and also with family. Yep. So whenever you're part of the equation in a relationship, mm-hmm. attachment's relevant. Okay. Yeah. Scary, right? Mm-hmm. But also very important. Intriguing I though. I know. Intriguing. I know. So I've picked a good one. Yep. And you had no idea? No idea. No idea. Fantastic. Fantastic. So here's a few big questions, okay? Mm-hmm. Will you be there for me? Yeah, always. No, I don't mean you and me. <laughs> You're gorgeous. But you know that big question you throw out into the world or you throw out to your loved one, will you be there for me? Do I deserve to be loved? Mm. And do I feel safe? Mm-hmm. They're pretty big ones. They're, it is. Yeah. So if we think about what's fundamentally important, we've got our, our physical needs, right? Mm-hmm. So we've got obviously food, water, shelter. And then just down from that, good old Maslow tells us that it's do we feel secure? Yep. And it's huge. 
It absolutely is mm. huge. So provided we're not going to be eaten by saber tooth tiger, tab- help me, saber tooth tiger. Eaten by it. them. Yes, tonight. Then we want to make sure we feel secure. Okay. So, okay. Now, I want to get into a bit of a background. I'm not going to be a historian here, but I just need to give you a bit of a back, yes. a bit of context. Okay. So we came across attachment style during World War II. Okay. A very, very cool guy called John Bowlby and along after him came Mary Ainsworth. They basically studied kids in World War II mm. who were displaced. Mm. I know. It's a sad origin. Mm. So all of these kids were taken from their families mm-hmm. because a whole lot of trauma, obviously avoiding the bombing or their children or their parents were, you know, taken or mm. killed, killed. etc. Yeah. And so all of these orphans and um, they came along and they studied what happened to them. Lo and behold, they were, got psychologically quite messed up mm-hmm. and there was a clear pattern in how they responded. Okay. And from that, we then went, we got broader, psychology went and looked at the general population and this is what we've discovered. Right. So there's a lot of, lot of finesse to this. There's a lot more detail but I'm going to sp- speak broadly. So half the population, right, mm-hmm. is securely attached, half the population mm-hmm. and half the population are insecurely attached. Mm-hmm. Now, that's enormous. Mm. Can you imagine, you know, if half the population has some sort mm. of other physical or psychological issue? It's massive. Mm. So um, the securely attached crowd, right, they're like puppy dogs. And they say, hey, I'm pretty happy with who I am. Yep. And you're lucky to be with me. So <laughs> they're a bit cocky. Yeah. But in a, in a kind of healthy way. Yep. And they don't really put much time into it. When you're securely attached, you, you, you just don't have much heat around it. So you just kind of cruise along. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Yes. And they say, hey, if you – they're not naive. They – well, they can be, but not typically. And they think if you're going to hurt me, if you're going to abandon me, then I'm going to hurt. But firstly, it's your loss. Yep. they're a bit cocky. And secondly, I know I'm ultimately going to bounce back. Yeah. So they're not too scared. They're not too worried. Yep. You're, you're pretty lucky to have me. Yeah. So then the other half – are mm-hmm. divided into two groups. So we've got 25% and 25%. They both make up the other half and they're called insecurely attached. Mm-hmm. Haven't heard any of these words yet? Are these all new to you? Or this is all new to me. All new. Good but I'm relating to it. Yeah. Well, we're about to get into lots of case studies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the insecure crowd, they're divided into two groups. So we've got the first group called anxious insecure. Yep. And the second group, I said, mm. is avoidant insecure. Mm. So the anxious and secure are the ones that say, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Needy. Exactly. The word is clingy. Mm. Okay. And they're seeking reassurance. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're saying, I don't know who I f- how I feel about myself. I think I might not be okay. Do you really mm. want to be with me? And they seek that reassurance. So they have all these kind of invisible hoops. If, if she loves me, she'll do this. If he loves me, he'll yep. do that. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so they have all these hoops. And um, they they are continually wanting to get reassured, and um, and that's they're just sort of chasing that. So we'll come back to that crowd. That's hard work. Well, it's really hard work. It's really hard. And you know what the thing about this crowd is? They think if I get enough reassurance, I will feel better. But they probably never can get they, enough. No, no, because fundamentally it comes from within, and that is cliche, but it's self love. Mm. So they're thinking if I just fill up my bucket, I'm going to feel better. But there's a hole in their bucket. And they have to figure it out for themselves. Yep. So obviously love from others will help them enormously, but they have to join the dots. Yes. Yeah. And then the other 25% are the avoidant crowd. And the avoidant mm-hmm. crowd are kind of, they look very calm, mm-hmm. they look very chilled, but they're kind of ducks. So on the top they're, they're calm, but underneath their little feet are going really, really fast. Yep. And they're as anxious as the other crowd. And their logic is I've been hurt before, so why the hell would I put myself out there and get hurt again? Yeah. Yep. And so they're, they're the ones that kind of keep it cool. And um, and so that really gets in the way of mm. relationships, obviously. And it's not that they don't want to be loved. They're human, of course. But they're a bit scared of being hurt. Yep. So basically, whenever we have rough times, we have these this default that we fall back into. Okay. And we can get either anxious, insecure, or avoid and insecure. Now, I know we've got pretty heavy pretty quick. Mm. We have. How you going? Great. <laughs> what are you thinking? I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking I'm really pleased that you said in the beginning how this is fluid, how you can be oh. one way at some point. Like everyone can can yep. fluctuate between the difference because mm. I can automatically think of times in my life mm. where I've been two of those. Two of those scenarios are yep. typical of me. Yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And we move around. So you might start off secure and then you might have some knocks Mm -hmm. and you might become avoidant Mm. and then you might recover a bit and you become more secure. We might have good life experiences and then you might get knocked around. You might become anxious and then Mm. you might become secure and you move around. So Mm. it's, um, that's the good news. Mm. The bad news is, is that if you're in the anxious group or the avoidant group, it's, it's going to be a pretty big roadblock until you get yourself sorted mm. out. And you could really sabotage relationships. Can you see? Yes. How, yeah. Yes. Because if, if you're needy, if mm. you're trying to fill your bucket, yep. it's, A, it's hard work for you, but it's also very hard work for the person mm. in the relationship with you. Oh, constantly. To keep up, it, it, that would be exhausting. Yeah, reassure, and, reassure. Mm, tiring. Absolutely. And that, that can also go into the realm of people being very jealous. Yeah, right. Have you seen people who just, they don't yes. need any material and they just get jealous? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And always think they're missing out. Yeah. Or they, or they just think that the person's out there and if there's a male looking their way, then they're threatened, mm. you know, or a female. Mm. Absolutely. And um, it's, pretty, um, it's a pretty tough one because if you've got a partner – who's out there questioning you, there's nothing you can say. You can't defend yourself because there's no actual real reality to it. No, there's not. Mm, it's pretty tough. Mm. Yeah. So isn't it crazy we don't know about this? Uh, yes. See, this is my frustration. There's so much about psychology that's fundamental and it's not out there. This is why you love your job. I do love my job. You do? I do. Yes. I do. I often say to my lovely John that if we won the lot, I'd still be working well and truly. I think you would be. I would be. I would be. And maybe not the extreme hours. Would you share the lotto with me? But I'm, I would. <laughs> I would. No, actually, you know what? I don't do the hours for – it's just I'm trying to squeeze people in. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've got a lot of, lot of – lot to give. Wow, and a lot of people. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So attachment comes mm. up all the time. So a client might come in and they might be saying, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. Don't need – don't need people, don't need a relationship, I'm all good. Yep. yep. I'm fine. And they're coming across, you know, a bit James Bond, you know. Yep. I'm pretty cool. And we just pull back the layer and sure enough, they've been hurt and they fear being hurt again mm. and they're actually incredibly lonely and they're incredibly fearful. Mm. And then we talk about attachment style. So there's lots of kind of lead-ins to talking about this topic. We talk about this all the time. Yep. Yeah. And so when people start to realise what they're doing, then obviously information's power, right? Yep. Mm. I was about to say, how do you go about resolving this? And it's about obviously understanding yourself more. Enormously, yeah. It's first of all working out where what's gone wrong, mm. you know, where you're, at, where you're at in that stage in life and um, working out a lot of your, it's called self-schemas. So what are your, what's your self-talk? What's your relationship with yourself? How rational is that? And we kind of ground that. A lot of work around that. A mm. lot of self-monitoring. A lot of people don't monitor what they're thinking. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of work in there, Mm. you know, that's okay. It's okay. That's a doable thing. It is. And it's it's, a lot of it just would be natural in your evolution of yourself if you were aware of it, started becoming aware of it and thinking about it. Yeah, well, you know, as soon as you know that you're down a, going down an old, old um, cycle, you can, Mm. you can at least be aware of it to pull yourself Mm. up a bit. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And also you can put yourself out there a little bit more and go, okay, I'm really scared, but I'm going to put myself out there and give you opportunity, yourself opportunity to experience healthy love again, more likely as opposed to hiding away if you're avoidant. Do you think people become more aware of this within themselves at the older they get? I think you'd want to. Mm. I mean, you know, patterns repeat unless you mm. kind of change your direction, mm. but plenty of people don't as mm. well. Yeah, absolutely. And so when I meet people, I kind of like can quite honestly, I can kind of figure out where they're at pretty quick. Yeah, Mm. absolutely. They should teach this in school. Yes, Yes. they should. Yeah, yeah. Just ask my kids. It would be far more valuable than algebra (laughs) or the recorder. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, I started off uh, secure. Mm -hmm. I did. I did well and truly. And then different life experiences became anxious Mm. and then a bit avoidant, then back to secure. I've spent most of my life insecure. I'm well and truly in the secure state now. I'm a bit of a goofy puppy dog, you could say. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I can see when your tail's <laughs> wagging. <Yes. laughs> but, but, you know, it's quite good that I've spent time in different groups. Um, yes. So that then you can relate to that and you can see it, mm. you know. So that's a huge thing, isn't mm. it? Yes, for sure. Absolutely. 
Yeah. For sure. So mm-hmm. here we go. I am going to read a statement to you and I want to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay, now I, I'm not going to paraphrase this because it's really good now because mm. I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. I yes. know, I know. So, you know, Signposts for Living, mm-hmm, yes, mm-hmm. is actually a book that's coming out. It's not ready yet. We're, we're, it's coming through the publishing world. But anyway, here we go. Ready? Mm-hmm. Hit me. I, I'm going <laughs> to. Okay. The family home is the most powerful structure of human belonging in the world. It is a place where growth launching and consolidation occurs. Unfortunately, it's also the place where the most wounds can be inflicted, wounds that can take a lifetime to heal. Mm. Yeah. Very profound. Well, you know, a lot of people have this cliche, oh, psychologists, they just want to talk about your childhood. Yes. It's true. It is. It is true. Have you figured out why it's true? Well, you're a product of your upbringing, really. That's what you learn as a little kid and growing up within your family dynamics and what you think is normal mm. is dictates a lot of your life patterns, I guess, and how you're going to think about things and react to things and handle things down the track. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's, it's, it's formative, isn't it? Mm. It's where we start off from. It's S- a, yeah. So much pressure though these days to get it all right. Oh, like, well, that's not realistic, is it? No. No. Did you have, let's let take a slight side issue. Here. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of the good enough parent? No. Okay. Well, this is just so we all, I'd like to share this so okay. we all sleep well mm-hmm. at night. So there's something called the good enough parent, mm-hmm. <laughs> which basically says it's incredibly important to not be an amazing parent. Good. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no. So, so, you know, with parenting, obviously, obviously we want to love our child. We want to. Yeah. We want to let them know all of the areas about them we celebrate and we want to bring them up to be great little human beings. But we can't be ideal. Mm. If we're too shiny, if we're too, too, um, you know, doting and and just, you know, on our child's every whim, Mm. then can you see what goes wrong? Mm -hmm. I sure can. What's Mm. that? Well, it's not a realistic way that life runs, is it, down the track? I love you. Absolutely. And these kids are in for a big disappointment when they come crashing back to earth as right. adults. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't show the, the true human human condition, mm. which is that we're all fallible, we're all messy. Mm. Absolutely. And so if they have this ideal situation where the world revolves around them and it's all their way, they come into the real world and it's like a crashing reality. Mm. Yeah. So we've got to make mistakes as parents. Mm-hmm. We've got to be a little bit grumpy, a bit, bit, bit inconsistent sometimes, you know, not yep. be too... To on the ball all the time. Yep. Have your good days and your bad. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Just, yeah. So, you know, just taking the pressure off, mm-hmm. getting it all right. So it's, yeah, it's called yep. the good enough parent. Right. And there's a lot of research around that. I like that. I know. People love when I tell them about mm. that. Yeah. It does. I would argue, another tangent, you ready for mm. this? <laughs> Are you rolling your eyes? No. <laughs> I would argue that um, parental guilt is the strongest of emotions. Oh, I would agree with that. Mm. It's hard. Oh, it drives your thoughts constantly if you've got it. Yep. If night, got it. <laughs> night and day. No, I mean, really, mm. like, you know, mm. you, you, you stuff up and you just torture yourself mm. over that, don't you? Yep. Yeah, and yet. Or even if you haven't stuffed up, if you think you may have, you don't know even. Or if, if your kids are off track because they're, again, humans and they're kind of going through their various stages mm. and they've got to figure it all out and you go, was it my fault? Mm. Is there something more I could have done? Mm. Or the kids come and coming back and, you know, they're blaming you because they haven't figured out stuff. That That's a great fear out. of mine. What's that? Kids coming back down the track uh, and telling me I did a hopeless job or I got something wrong. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I, and I know that that's an unrealistic thing to be concerned about. Mm-hmm. And I know I could say with hand on my heart, I tried. You do, well, you, yeah. You, but yeah. It, is, it does. I do think about it. You're incredibly child-centred in your parenting, darling. Yeah, well, you know. Yeah. But I, we all but, are. But you're well, – no, that's not true. Oh, okay. <laughs> but many, many most hopefully are. But um, no, I mean, honestly, that's my point. Yeah. Uh, um, maternal guilt, paternal guilt, it's just cruel, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. So – Back to where we were. I know. I love these tangents. So we're back to the family home. So here's mm. the thing. Mm. When we look at our attachment style, we really have to look at our home base. Yeah. And we have to say, okay, as a kid, how did I figure out how I felt about myself? Mm-hmm. how I felt about people around me that, that loved me mm-hmm. and how I felt about the world. Okay. And it really shapes us enormously. 
and I'm really fascinated by different cultures mm. and how different family dynamics work and different, mm. you know, where the child sits and how they're treated. I love coming across different cultures and hearing about all that. So interesting. I know. I know. Never gets boring. Nothing actually gets boring for me, really. No, it doesn't, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Human beings. <laughs> no. So explain to me then why I think grandparents do a great job of being parents. Oh, that's a great task. Is that another episode? No, <laughs> no. Bring in the tangent. I'll go with that. Okay, so here's the thing. When you're a parent, you're 24-7, mm. aren't you? So it's when you're tired and you're grumpy and you're just constant, aren't you? And you also have your own personal stresses because when you're going through your 30s and your 40s, you're going through your career, your career mm. you know, challenges, your financial challenges, you're establishing yourself. And you're also, I would argue that people don't become truly confident until they're in their 40s. Mm. So, you know, you've just got a lot going on, mm. um, whereas grandparents give them back, don't yep. you think? So they get the good bits. They do. They get to come in and they're all fresh. Mm. They've also been quite excited, so there's lots of anticipation. Mm. And um, and they're not responsible for the child. No. No. And, you know, hopefully they come in and support. Many come in and criticise. Yeah. I hate to admit it. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, no, grandparents have the, the luxury of that. And, and I would like to think that they've actually had the capacity to go back and go, oh, that, I didn't do that so well. Mm. Maybe I could get that mm. right with the next generation. Because how many times do you hear people say, my mum's a better grandma oh. than what she was mother? Oh, wow. I hear people in Frequent. my age group saying that about I, their parents. I hear it a lot. Mm. I hear it a lot. And isn't that great? Mm. You know. I hope my <laughs> kids say it. Mm. Darling. My great kids think I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But no, honestly, I think it's I think this whole grandparent thing is actually a really good way of holding up a mirror for what the pressures parents face. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's a really good point. Mm. It's a really good point. So back to the parenting <laughs> issue. So here's the thing. Yes. Okay. Um, children are trying to work out who am I? Mm. And um, how do I fit with other people? Am I important? So therefore, if those needs aren't met, if they are not getting um, uh, validation mm -hmm. um, where they're saying, hey, this is what's special about you and I celebrate this about you and, yeah, you can do that. I'm not saying, you know, you're the best artist in the world and you're the best sportsman in the world and that kind of rubbish. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, hey, this is you're enjoying yourself and, and that kind of reflection. So when you have that kind of feedback from a parent, the child actually develops their self-talk. So mm -hmm. they're, they're relatively a blank, blank canvas mm -hmm. and they're really getting a lot of that self-talk from the parent. Now, if they have a parent that doesn't give them any of that prizing of the child – then that's neglect. Mm -hmm. Now, the fascinating thing about the neglect is that the child doesn't know that they've had it. They think it's normal. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You don't know any different. No, no. And they also might not experience being a priority in the family mm. at all. There isn't. It's not child-centred. Mm -hmm. It's very much the child fits in with the parent. And there's a degree of that in the real world. But when it's completely the case, mm. um, then the child grows up and says, I'm, I'm not a, I don't deserve this space. I don't, my needs aren't important. I don't know how to put my needs ahead in a relationship. And so their ability to advocate for themselves and to be in a secure, healthy relationship is really damaged. Yep, I can understand that. Yes, but neglect is the is like the um oh, help me with this. It's it's the hidden it's the hidden um, um. you know <laughs> the hidden wound, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Now the flip side of that is abuse. Okay. Now that's obvious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So that's if we've got verbal abuse. Or if we've got physical abuse and obviously sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So psychological abuse out of all that is, um, I mean, sexual is very high and physical as well, but psychological is quite different in that it really forms that person's sense of themselves. So if a child mm -hmm. grows up and they're told the whole time, you know, you're an idiot, you're not bright, or no one likes you. Or I had a, a client um, recently whose um, father was actually really, you know, had some significant mental health issues. And um, the father would say to the daughter, you know, oh, you know, uncle and un the uncles and aunts don't like you because you're just like me. And all of mm. these, yeah, all of these really kind of, you know, systemic kind of comments, it was, mm. it was really quite damaging. And so she's grown up thinking there's something inherently wrong with me. So you can really see how so much mm. damage can happen. Now, these are extreme cases, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm. So... Yeah, so a lot of people come and we spend a lot of time talking about their childhood and things that were not okay. And um, and that's and then Do you surprise a lot of people? What do you mean? With what was not okay? 
about their childhood. Like Absolutely. Was, yeah. yeah. It's a good point. It's a good point. So they come in and they just sort of talk haphazardly and I go, you know what, that's not great. Or another way I'd phrase it is, so you've got kids, yes. Mm. You love them very much, yes. You want to be a great parent, yes. So the way your parents treated you, would you do that? Mm. No, no. So maybe it wasn't okay for you. How did that shape you? And and I have to really let people know, look, this is not a witch hunt. It's mm. not. I'm not trying to point fingers. Mm. We're just trying to understand their how they've formed, mm. you know. Good and point. It, really good point because there would be a, a sense of guilt of. Oh, yeah. Mm. People come in and they're incredibly protective of their family. And, you know, mm. if, if they've got. If they've got a, a healthy bond with them, absolutely, that's great. But um, no, it's it's more about having compassion for all parties. You know, a lot of parents do a lot of a lot of um, not great things because they are not great in in their life. Yeah, and you know, a lot of knee jerk reactive parenting going on. Yeah, there'd be a lot of um, history repeating itself too, wouldn't it? Like- oh, enormously, yeah. Oh my gosh, I could write books on this. <laughs> you probably have. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the stories, and often they're really historical, mm. like quite fascinating, you know. So mm. I hear about people who have, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. Here we are in Australia and I hear about people coming over from the Holocaust and they come down here and then this group in Melbourne and this all happens and, and, it, and you just hear about the trauma, mm. the intergenerational trauma. Mm. It's incredible. And so, you know, the parents are doing really well getting food on the table. Mm. And to just be smiling. Mm. And they don't have it in them to give the nurturance. So, mm. yeah, they neglect. Yeah, but they don't mean it. No. Yeah. So it's it's extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, it can come down to small things. Uh, for example, uh, uh, an example I can think of is I've got a family who are um, very, 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 very artsy. Mm-hmm. You know, they're creatives. And they're very into politics and they're they're just, you know, you know, lots of colourful conversations go on mm-hmm. in that house, and um, which is great. Now they have got one family member who's straight laced, right? Yep, wants to be a lawyer. Mm-hmm. He's in in the process. He wants to wear corporate gear. That's what he wants to wear. Now he has grown up being told you're wrong. There's something wrong with you. Mm. You know, you've been kind of sucked into, you know, the, the yeah, right, because it's not. Yeah. How the rest of them are. Absolutely, into the conservative world. And so he's grown up hearing, I'm not okay. So they haven't meant anything wrong by mm. that, but he's he's grown up and he's quite insecure within himself because he just doesn't fit. So it doesn't have to be um, extreme abuse or extreme mm. neglect. It can just often be subtle messages and the person mm. grows up and says, I'm not okay. So it's the whole spectrum from extreme all the way through to mild. Yep. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Mm. I know. Can you see the cogs turning around in my head at the moment? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, wow. But, you know, it's so liberating when people realise this about themselves. Mm. Makes you understand then. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And isn't it cruel not to understand ourselves? Completely. It is. It, it, is. it would be torture. It is. So this is not other area. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's go throw another curveball mm-hmm. at it because that's what we do. Okay. Okay. Conditional love. Mm-hmm. Unconditional love. Mm. Who gets what? Parents, children. What's the deal? No. Well, oh. Co-parents. I don't know. That's that's. <laughs> really, <laughs> you don't give me any time to think I about it. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Conditional love. I think conditional loves. I don't know. It's the way it is, mm. and I guess. Well, who does get unconditional love? Isn't there always conditions? Well, that's a really Why just blind your podcast out of the water? No, no, no. This is really interesting. So here's the deal, right? Yeah. So with children, they're supposed to have unconditional love from their parent. Yeah. That's supposed to be the one place where it doesn't matter what you yeah, do. Yes. You're going to be loved. Unconditional love, yes? Yes. So I'm just making the bit of a the punchline. Yes. <laughs> that if you don't have that unconditional love, then we become insecure. Yes. Yeah. So conditional love is for other people in our world where we have to have boundaries, where if they abuse us, we're not going to put up with it. If they turn out to be somebody who's not someone who value system wise we can have in our world, we don't put up with it. So conditional love. So partners are conditional love. Yes. Children are unconditional love. Yes. Now, obviously, we can have some kids that really go test us mm. and go, you know, we've, I've got a lot of clients whose kids go and get involved in drug addiction and they can get involved in theft and all sorts of things. 
Um, but it's really interesting. The parents kind of just keep keep a line out to them. Mm. Yeah. So they have mm. boundaries still. But yes. They, they hang in there. Whereas if you had a partner who was doing that, yeah, they'd be, be like, see you later. Mm. Well, you should anyway if you've got a bit of self-care. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's another right. way of looking at mm. attachment, the fact yep. that we're fundamentally wanting to have that un- unconditional love. Yes. And yeah. if you don't grow up feeling that, there would be ramifications. That's it. And I, I just want to, you know, um, I feel a bit nauseated when couples come in and they, they stare at each other and they say to me, oh, we have unconditional love for each other. <laughs> and I say, well, let me tell you. I bet you they have joint Facebook accounts too, you know, those Facebook <laughs> accounts that are. I don't know about Facebook. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> learning curve. That's a whole conversation. <laughs> Oh, definitely. Okay. So how do you love yourself if you've grown up and you haven't felt love from others? You probably don't and you probably have to acknowledge that and learn about that and yes. educate yourself and yeah. work that out. How are you going to do that? And I think that would be really hard to do if you brought up with it. Yeah. That would be a massive task, I would suspect. Well, it's definitely it's definitely um, swimming, you know, going up against the current. Because mm. hey. you'd have to change your instincts, Nelly. Interesting, you said instincts twice last right. podcast and this one. What do you mean by instincts? Well, I guess what I mean by instincts is sorry. Um, <laughs> see, it's all about me now. <laughs> um, instincts is the way your automatic thoughts, the way you th- you think automatically about something or a situation or a scenario. Yeah, is your instinct. So, if your instinct was not to give yourself self love. It would be very a big job mm. to turn that around. Mm. So yeah, so that's kind of like when you have like a, an automatic reaction. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So you have to learn to do self love, mm. yes, mm. to then receive love by others. Yes, punchline. And obviously that process, it's its really ironic. I've got some people that say, oh, I'm going to just sort myself out first and then I'm going to have a relationship. What are your thoughts on that? Chicken and the egg, what do you think? Yeah, I can understand why they're saying that, but it's yeah, it's counterproductive. Do you think that's just a defence mechanism? Uh, it could be, yeah. I also think some people genuinely probably think they need to sort themselves out and think they can do it. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting thing because obviously we do need to take time for ourselves and become as secure as we can within ourselves. But we um, really can't learn what a healthy relationship is unless we're in, a, in one. Mm. And so uh, I've had a lot of clients who come along and they're basically planning to kind of stay out of relationship until they're all sorted. And it's great to come to a certain point, but at some point yes. you do have to get yourself out of there. Yes, yes, I agree. Which is very scary because mm. they're going to get hurt. And unlike the secure person who says, okay, I'm going to bungee, ja- bungee back so I'm going to be okay, the insecure mm. person says, I don't think I will. And the avoidant person says, I don't think I will. Mm. So I'm going to play it safe. Yep. Um, yeah. I'm mm. either going to cling to someone and keep kind of, as you say, clinging, harassing them, and um, or I'm going to be avoidant. It's better to have loved and lost than to have never have loved at all. Where does that come from? Oh, my dad said that. To the end. <laughs> I broke up with someone once and I was in tears. <laughs> oh. I was probably being clingy and had the wrong attachment. You know, I, actually, I actually think that's a famous saying. It is. It is. We must yeah, it wasn't. Google. It wasn't just Rick's. So. <laughs> your dad can take credit for it. Yeah, we'll give it to him. <laughs> okay, so this is all about becoming unstuck, mm-hmm. growing, moving, healing, learning and... Yeah, it's all about old patterns and becoming aware of them so we can become free of them. Yeah. It's a bit heavy in the end, isn't it? It is. And recognising that is such a learning curve. Oh, enormous. Absolutely. I mean, fundamentally learning why do I do what I do. That's what psychology is, mm. all about why do I do what I do. Mm. And um, attachment, I cannot tell you how enormous it is. I'd put it at about 80%. Mm. Enormous. Am I selling like the, it? Yeah, yeah. It's a pillar of <laughs> what who we are, isn't it? That's it. That's it. Oh, so, you know, my plan is to just kind of drop this from the sky and educate everybody. Pamphlets. Pamphlets. Let's do pamphlets. All right. All right. Well, you know, this is, I'm sorry it got a bit heavy, but I find it just so important. 
it's yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, food, okay. for, food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as you know, you can find me on KirstenHunterAuthor.com. The whole lot of goodies in there. We've got the Facebook page, Kirsten Hunter. That you don't know about, author. but anyway. I've got to learn about that, yeah. <laughs> Instagram handle, Kirsten Hunter Author. Twitter, Kirsten Hunter AU. YouTube channel, Psych in Your Car. And here we are, podcasting on Signposts for Living with Dr. Kirsten Hunter. Darling, I have so much fun with you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too heavy. Next time we'll go no. light. Yes, light. Uh, light and heavy. We can alternate. We can. All right. You're adorable. See you. Thank you, sweetie. Bye. Bye.